Mars Girl. I'm Josh Knight the First. And welcome to episode 115 of Mokorgi Play, the only podcast dedicated solely to all things City Hunter. On today's podcast, we're going to cover season 2, episode 63 of City Hunter, titled Good Luck, My Sweeper, City Streets for Both of Us, Part 3. Oh, it's the last episode of the season. Well, yep, that's this is going to be two full seasons under our belt now, and uh, it's kind of I'm kind of sad to see it go. This is arguably the better of the two seasons. I think it's quite possibly the best season of City Hunter, yeah, honestly. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you on that. There's it's just... the longest one, but it has some of the best, biggest beats, the best moments of the entire animated storytelling. Oh yeah, for sure, for sure. And the thing of it here is, I think it's a satisfying ending, all things considered, if you take into consideration that they might not have thought they were getting another season after this, which they did. They did get another season. They got another two seasons, two very short seasons by comparison. But that having been said, I think it ends in such a way that you're not necessarily sure that they're sure that they're going to get more out of it. Like, if they thought, well, if we have to end here, it's just kind of a nice way to end. Well, it, it's not too dissimilar from the way the manga eventually did end, right? Where everything just kind of looked like Kaori and Ryo just kept doing what they were doing? This is like the second time they've done that now. Uh Like, at some point... Yes, it's like they just keep being City Hunter. Although this one is slightly different because it ends less with more work, although they do get more work, but also they just get to hang out together and be happy together. Yeah, that's true. And the thing too is, again, like we were saying this last episode, but it was kind of bittersweet considering we do this for the sake of the podcast, that this was the last time we were going to hear Sarah and still love her. Like, I really cannot impress to you guys how much I love Sarah. Sarah as an opening. Sarah is a very good opening. I really like Still Love Her as an ending. I think it's very sentimental. Well, it, it becomes more sentimental once you have that in the context of the show itself. Like, the episode that it was attached to for the first time really impresses to you, oh, this means something. Whereas right. I think if you hear Still Love Her out of context, it doesn't mean as much. Maybe not, but it's kind of a nice Christmas time song. <laughs> it is, yeah, so w- which is why it was kind of weird. Like I said, the first time we saw it, we didn't realize that this was the new ending. It just kind of seemed like a one off that kept going. Yeah, exactly. We really thought, oh, this is just for Christmas. And then, oh, it came back next week. And so it was kind of like the anime version of the house on your street that never took down their Christmas lights, and it's already like June. But then you kind of got used to it. And once they finally took down the Christmas lights, you're like, oh, I kind of miss him. <laughs> <laughs> it is kind of like that. And as we're recording this, we are one week out, or even less than at this point, because I think it's Friday that it drops, right? No, if it's the 25th, then that's in four days, so that's Thursday. Or a little earlier in Japan, I assume. We're less than a week out. We're yeah. less than a week out from the Netflix City Hunter movie, which I do believe that's the next thing we're going to cover. We're going to put a pause on what we would normally cover, because next up, it would be a movie anyway. It would have been Bay City Wars next, and then we would have started in with City Hunter 3. But it just so happened with all those breaks that we took that we lined up right with the end of season two and Netflix City Hunter dropping that next week. Like, I think it would be a mistake not to get on the Netflix City Hunter film the week that it comes out. That would have been a mistake. So I think that's what we were going to end up doing next week after we're done with this episode. But we really do have to focus on this episode before we get there. Right, right. So, it, And it's going to be two movies back to back because either way, we're covering this. Then we're going to have to cover Bay City War. Right. And then we'll start in with City Hunter 3. So that's the progression here. That's where we're going. Otherwise, we're going in chronological release order, but we just happen to actually have new City Hunter media, so... Like, mind you, remember, when we started this podcast way back when, we did not think there would be more new we, stuff. We were not convinced that they were going to make more City Hunter. Of we, anything. We, we thought this was it. <laughs> we, we thought, thought we, they were done. <laughs> we thought we had a finite resource, and we knew exactly what we were getting ourselves into. We knew it was going to be a couple of years at least that we would be doing this and then we thought that's it that's all we got and then they had to go and make another animated movie and a Takarazuka stage play and then this movie who knows because now I get the feeling they're going to make more animated movies and who maybe knows? this one if it does well it gets a sequel yeah, we'll see what happens because you see they do that a lot in Japan whenever a live action adaptation does well it usually gets at least one extra movie they might do it who knows we need to see it and see where it leaves off in order to really understand is there an opening for them to do 
more. Because I can think of at least two good reasons, which we've kind of talked about last week, about why they would make a sequel, is one, if they're telling the story of Angel Dust, that does not get covered in one movie. They already proved that. They can't do it. I don't know how you do it. There's too much backstory. I don't know how long the runtime of this movie is. Do we know that yet? Actually, we might be able to look it up if you go to Netflix right now. Actually, that reminds me, as we're looking it up right now, if you go over to Netflix right now and go to the City Hunter page, which popped up right there, thankfully, you can actually hear the dub for the longer trailer now. Yeah, the English dub, which, again, I'm still not totally gelling with, but we're probably going to end up watching this movie twice so we'll see there, there's no probably we are watching this movie twice that yeah, is yeah, that yeah, is a yeah. given for us here we'll, we'll see like maybe the trailer doesn't do it justice and i'm gonna give it the fair shake it deserves we'll see what happens but no it's it's an hour and 44 minutes like that's a pretty good runtime that's a decent runtime yeah but still i don't see how it's enough to fit everything that's super important to city hunter in there i just don't see it's it an happening. intro yeah it's at least an intro but you can't just leave it at that. I know, I know. It, it feels like there's too much. Which is why Takarazuka, you know, that's a whole ass stage play, and then they've got an intermission. It's like two movies. Well, so. like, you stay for the play. That's the way Takarazuka works. You stay for the play, and then you've got, like, an extra hour of sequins and dance but on that's, top of that. that's not even what I'm talking about. I'm talking about they had a whole ass play with an intermission in the middle, and I'm not even talking about the parts with the Vegas showgirls dancing at the end. Yeah, That's yeah. not even the part I'm talking about. I'm saying it's long enough to begin with, and they covered a lot. They did, and they made Makimura a ghost to be there <laughs> the entire movie. So you never you never lost him, even though he's only in the narrative for so long. See, that's the thing I'm wondering about for this movie, because when you look at the poster they've been going with, you see Ryo, you see Kaori, and you see Makimura, but you know Makimura has to die quick. Otherwise, we can't get this thing moving. I don't know. It sounds like he has quite a bit of prominence and is quite important, which means we don't move this narrative very far. That's what that sounds sounds like it sounds like it's only an introductory kind of a movie so if they give Ryo and Makimura because we're just kind of speculating at this point if they give them more business before they kill him off I'm actually okay with that mm -hmm. but that will further impress to me they have to make a sequel yeah I would agree but we'll find out soon enough four days we're gonna be on top of that mess we're gonna be there hey what about that song that finally the music videos yes that's right so as we were recording this yesterday TM Network finally dropped their their music video and thereby full version of Get Wild Continual, which you can now look at over on YouTube. And I, I gotta be honest, this is probably my favorite remake, reuse of the song that I've heard out of them. Because they've you, made a few. T TM Network won't stop making new versions of this song, actually. They're kind of beating that dead horse, if I'm to be well, honest. To with be you. fair, though, that song has carried them for the better part of 40 years. Oh, yeah. I mean, like, if it works, like, would you stop doing the thing? that worked nope <laughs> like i don't need every single version of that song or all of their performances where they get the keyboardist coming in with the da -na -na -na, and then he fires the, off like the pyrotechnics the pyrotechnics in the background but this one i i do like that they're kind of celebrating the fact that this song has been carrying them for 40 years because you see them performing it now and then a lot of archive footage of them performing in different venues well there's an entire album that they just recently released that i think is like nothing but all their different versions of get wild and people were really excited about it so i mean cool it's working i don't know i, I like it I, it's okay I think it'll I don't fit have a just with fine it. with this live-action movie that we're getting. Well, especially considering this isn't the 80s. They're, they've put it in a modern locale, modern adaptation. Like, as you see in the trailer, Uber Eats is mentioned, so this definitely is not the 1980s. No, so. not by a long shot. No. But let's go ahead and take it back to the 80s as we cover this last episode of City Hunter 2. The last episode of this three-episode arc. Yes. So again, because this is our one and only three-parter, we gotta do another recap. Oh my god. So, again, going back over it. Mary, new character, but somebody that Ryo already knows. Former partner, very jealous of Cowdy, or at least trying to get them to not talk to each other anymore. She knows a bunch of secrets about Ryo's past, about how he was a child soldier, and that he doesn't know anything about his past and when he was born. So he doesn't have a birthday or anything. And then Cowdy's like, oh no, why didn't he tell me any of that? Did he care more about Mary than he cared about me? And then Umibozu came along and he was like, ah, don't worry about it. Mary's just being 
being a dick. <laughs> Ryo hasn't told anybody that information. It's not about you and it's not about her. He's just trying to make sure that he protects you and he doesn't want you to get scared and run off. And Kaori's like, well, only Bozu, that makes a lot of sense. Thanks, man. Uh, that makes me feel a lot better about this. Then in the second episode, Kaori goes up to Ryo and is like, hey, so I'm disappointed you didn't tell me all of this information, but listen, I'm gonna give you a birthday. You're 30 years old you're, now. You're 30 years old, and so you better get used to it. And Ryo gave her a kiss on the forehead and was like, thanks, babe, and then walked <laughs> away. And then we found out that Mary was actually here to kill Ryo on orders from some guy that both she and Ryo had pissed off way back when they were partners. And she's got a guy who we're only finding out at the end of this episode, we'll go ahead and tell you guys up front, is her fiancé. She doesn't mention that. She failed to mention that this whole time. She did say that, like, oh, I care about this guy because he saw me and he turned me into, like, a model with a career and I realized that I could live out in the sunlight and not in the underworld. So it was very clear she cared about him. She never mentioned that they were engaged. Yeah, so. she kind of left that part out. And so she's doing all this for him because they got off the plane at Narita and he immediately got kidnapped and they told her, hey, kill Ryo or else we kill your boy. And so she thinks that's what she has to do. So she spends the entire second episode doing really stupid things to try and kill Ryo. And then when she realizes she can't do it, she hopes that Ryo will kill her. Then she tries to kill herself. And then Umi Bozu prevents her from doing that. And then the three of them are like, all right, we're going to go go in there and we're gonna get your boy back from this guy who kidnapped him. Except she's like, no, I don't want to get any more people in trouble for things that I have done. And then she steals Umi Bozu's land cruiser vehicle. She steals Umi Bozu's vehicle. And that's where we're at right now. She's trying to drive off in a stolen car to try and save her boyfriend herself. And now we are caught up with everything that has just happened. And now we bring you to action already in progress. Where she's driving down the road, all sorry for her Self, woe is me. I gotta go save my boyfriend, fiance, person I care about. Eric. Eric. Who, I'm not sure that we covered this last week. The way that Eric is drawn, he literally just looks like Rio's character model, but with facial hair. I mean, we might have said that. I know you and I discussed it just amongst ourselves when yeah. we were watching the episode. Yeah, he's not a very creative character model. No, not really. So yeah, she's now driving down the highway, going towards the place, which again, to recap that, Umi Bo Bozu was doing all this legwork behind Mary's back because Ryo figured out she was trying to kill him. So he hired Umi Bozu to be like, hey, find out who she's after, really. Who's forcing her to do this? Umi Bozu showed up like, hey, I know where he is. I know his address. Let's go get his ass. And so <laughs> Mary's like, but I cannot bring anybody else into my drama. I will kill him and then I'll kill myself. Woe is me. And she's saying this to herself in the car. Out loud, right? Or is it all in her head? I don't know. I feel like there you don't need to be doing this. We get the melodrama is there already. Okay, fine. But uh meanwhile There's something rumbling in her back seat. Underneath a blanket. Surprise, bitch! Cowrie is it's, here. It's Cowrie. Cowrie <laughs> has been hiding in the back seat. Mary's just like, what are you doing here? And Cowdy's just like, sup. <laughs> I, eh, I knew you would steal Umi Bozu's land cruiser. So I just hopped in the back seat and waited for you to take off with it. And she's like, well, how would you possibly know that? And Cowdy's over here like, well, I'm not exactly the amateur you think I am. Look at all the weapons I brought. And she she does, she gets in the front seat leaving behind her just a shit ton of guns and ammo. So and clearly she has raided the armory down underneath the building they live in. And she's brought everything. She's come to party. Everything. And Mary is just like, well, you really shouldn't be here. You're gonna get yourself hurt. Kauri, however, is like busting rank. She's like, oh, don't you worry about this. See, if it had just been you, that would have been one thing, but I'm here with you, so you're definitely not gonna die. Because Kauri knows Ryo always comes in to save Kauri. Right. So she trusts that Ryo's gonna come in for her. And Kauri's saying, oh, don't worry, I'm your lucky charm. And to me, that is saying, oh, Ryo might not have done this for you, but he'll do it for me. So she's <laughs> Really like bragging, like I'm, it I'm in her the face. top woman around here. Know your place. <laughs> 
And the thing is, too, she's like kind of sitting back, leaning back in the chair. Arms behind her head. Like she's kind of flexing right now. And we do want to bring up right here, when I say flexing, the shadow is done really good for her, like on her arms and face, all the definition there. And because we assume this is the last episode, I mean, we know it's the last episode, but we assume because of that fact, all of the episode's drawings, the faces, the backgrounds are very highly detailed. The art is very detailed. The animation is pretty good. The art is really, really good. Yeah. And the other thing to notice is that as they're driving here down the highway, we see this sometimes in other episodes, but here, more so than other episodes, there's a lot of like fake product placement on the signs and buildings they're driving by. Yeah, like some of it is kind of sort of real and some of it is clearly knockoff. These are not real brands, but you can tell what brand they're trying to mimic. So one of them was like Asahi Ya is what's on this sign in the background, but they're using the legitimate Asahi logo as in the, the alcohol, yeah, the, Asahi the, drink, beer. The, the drink. Like you can tell with the shape of the big A in Asahi for sure. Right. Asahi Asahi ya? So, like, Asahi store? What, do they sell nothing but Asahi beer in that building? So there's that. I liked the Max-er? M-A-X-E-R-R. Max-er. This, this might be something that younger viewers might not catch, but if you grew up in the 80s and 90s, you might be more familiar with Maxell brand audio tapes. Audio cassette tapes. Well, they, sure. they did VHS, too. I'm sure too. they did VHS, too. I think the, the logo in the background here even also said it was audio tape. That's, yes. that's what yeah. it said on the billboard in so the like background. So like blank cassette tapes. Yeah, blank cassette tapes where you would just record your own mixtapes or whatever. Yeah, yeah, record stuff off the radio, shit like that. And then the other one that I really liked was Niken, but the way that the font is done, it's clearly trying to be Nikon. The E in Niken, like you just change the shape a little bit and it's an O instead, and so it would become Nikon, like Nikon cameras right. or whatever. But then Sunrise had to throw themselves in twice. One side of the road had just the regular old S, the Sunrise logo, and then the other side of the road had their entire name and the logo, and the logo scrolling across in the background. It's great. It's super good. And as they're passing all of these signs and whatnot, Cowdy is still further breaking it down for Mary that she's got her figured out now. Like, Mary's trying to put her off trying to tell Cowdy, look, you don't know me like you think you know me. I'm cold-blooded. I'll leave your ass to die in the cold. That's that's who I am. That's the kind of person I am. Cowdy's telling her, no, no, I've got you figured out. You're actually really kind. The whole reason you were trying to get in between me and Ryo is that you knew that if you had been put on this mission to kill Ryo, it would hurt me because I'm the closest person to him. That's why you were trying to separate us. You were actually trying to spare me from the heartbreak of having to see Ryo go away. So you're actually really kind and when that didn't work you actually wanted Rio to kill you and that didn't work either so now we're doing this I'm helping you Calorie has a much nicer outlook on how this whole thing went down than I do that's a very kind interpretation on her part and even Mary kind of says that same thing because I have to admit I don't agree with Calorie <laughs> oh no no I, I I get where Calorie's coming from a more optimistic standpoint at no, this point Mary's just being weirdly selfish quite frankly <laughs> Well, because she keeps trying to say, I'm sorry for being so selfish. But then she doesn't stop being selfish. Yeah, that's the thing. If you're self-aware of it, but you keep doing it, that means nothing. Yeah. And now back at the apartment, we see Umi Bozu and Ryo figuring out, ah, crap, Kaori knew she was going to run and she raided the armory. And the armory is almost empty. Kaori took everything she could possibly fit while nobody was looking. She had to have taken several trips back and forth between the armory and the garage. Just because of what she can carry. Right. Right. So Rio figures, eh, well, time to get in the mini and take off after her. Hey, Umi Bozu, you did good. Uh, why don't you go back home to Miki? I got this from here. And so he's trying to take off in the mini, but as the little garage shutters are opening, Umi Bozu's just standing in the way like, hey, did you forget she took my car? He very specifically mentions his land cruiser, too. I mean, he says it in that cute Japanese way. You know how Japanese kind of shortens words in well, order to make things sound cute and Usually slangy. the way they do it is when they shorten a name of something, 
they try to shorten it down to four syllables. Yeah, they take the first two syllables of the first word and the first two syllables of the second word. So, like, I can specify two other examples. Final Fantasy and Dragon Quest. Final Fantasy becomes Faifan. Dragon Quest becomes Dorakue. So, fa i fa and Dorakue. Yeah. Yeah, those so, are the- So, so, Umi Bozu has now done this adorable little shortening of Land Cruiser and it became Lan Kri because I assume Cruiser, because it's got an I in it, so the yeah. pronunciation sounds kind of funny in Japanese. Or like Family Mart Chicken is shortened to Fami Chiki. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so they do it all the time. They do it for, for everything. Everything that has two words, especially if it originated in English, they're going to do a cute shortening. We know for a fact that what Umi Bozu drives is a Land Cruiser. Either way, so he's standing in front of Ryo's Mini Cooper and he's like, yeah, I can't exactly leave because Mary took my Land Cruiser, so I have to come with you to get my Land Cruiser back. <laughs> Ryo's having to look up out the windshield of the car like he's straining his neck. He has to look kind of up under the roof, peeking all well, the yeah, way up. Oh yeah, because Umibos is a damn mountain. And Mini Coopers are very small cars. They, they are not big. They're very short. <laughs> they're for the little people. <laughs> Which, I mean, Rio's not a small person. No, Rio's he's like 6'2", like, if I'm not mistaken. I thought he was just six feet, but I mean... No, I, I think he's a little taller than that. Whatever. Like, he still likes that Mini Cooper, though. Oh yeah, yeah. So as they're taking off from the apartment, Cowdy and Mary have already arrived at the abandoned, unfinished hotel, where this guy, Dave David Clive is holed up, and he's got all of his goons out front, and they're all armed to the teeth. So Cowdy and Mary decide, okay, we're gonna, like, sneak attack him. Mary is still trying to dissuade Cowdy, like, look, you really shouldn't be out here. Your ass isn't ready for this. You can't commit warfare acts on these people. You don't know. And Cowdy's like, huh, I'll show you. I've got this bazooka. All right, I'm gonna clear a path. Here we go. But she's got it pointed behind her instead of in front of her because she doesn't know the difference between the front and the back. The only thing that saves her ass is, like, she pulls the trigger anyway. And thankfully, like there's dudes that have been quietly sneaking up behind them the whole time and she hits them so it turns out it wasn't for nothing it was a mistake but it turned out okay actually and she's just over here like i meant to do that i mean she doesn't say that but but that's the attitude she takes and see i'm wondering here and this is just for my own sake this reminds me very much of the finale the climax of beverly hills cop 2 where the character uh billy does pretty much the same thing Uh Uh Where he has a little bazooka and there's people getting away that he's not really aiming at. And he's trying to figure out how the bazooka works. He hits the button and just luckily manages to blow up the truck that's getting away. Very fortunate. And I think it's only off by like a year. Maybe two years. Well, wait, which one came first? Because this is 89. I believe Beverly Hills Cop 2 was 88, if I'm not mistaken. 87. 87. Okay, so there, there's a little, little bit of a possibility. I don't know that it's exact, but we do know how much the production team of City Hunter loves American action movies. Very true. Very true. I, and I think that's true of Tsukasa Hojo himself, too. I think everybody working on this series as a whole loves the idea of action flicks. Right, because here at the hotel, it breaks out into an action flick. Because obviously, if you just set off a bazooka, people are going to hear that. Now, they all know that they're there. And Mary has to be like, oh shit, here we go. And so Mary's got her Uzi with a silencer. Cowdy's got a damn chain gun well, now. Cowdy's got everything. Everything under the sun. But, but she's yes. switched off now from the bazooka to a chain gun, which as we remind you guys, Umibozu normally prefers the chain gun. So Cowdy's not a tall person like Umibozu is. So this is. thing is very large on her. And she's still slanging that thing. Well, what I think is really interesting here is that under normal circumstances, because we're trying to fit this particular particular joke that they keep reusing, Cowrie often misses everything she's trying to shoot at. So she's hitting kind of just everything, but there's like a row of dudes who are just terrified of her, right? And somehow, the animation we're actually seeing is she is still firing like an outline right next to all of their bodies. Like even very up and Looney Tunes style. Very up and over and between people's arms and legs and around their heads and stuff, which to me really looks like 
like, she's doing this deliberately on purpose, trying to outline them and show them, I can get this close, she probably could hit them. Because the thing to point out here is that when she can't hit something, that is by design because Ryo has messed with the snub nose revolver that she has to purposely make sure that she can't actually shoot anybody. But this is not that gun, and we know that Ryo hasn't messed with all the other guns in the arsenal because he needs to use those. Right. So here, it does look like Cowdy, on her own, if given a different weapon, does have proficiency. And she's just choosing not to actually shoot people, which I think would match her character. I don't think she wants to shoot anybody. So one of the grunts that is down there breaks away, goes up to find this David Clive guy, and is like, hey boss, two women are attacking us, what do we do? And dude's like, huh, lead him up to the second floor. Just let him. And this dude's like, the detail on his face. He just has so many angry wrinkles all over the and place. Shadows. And shadows. Yeah, they've really gone in. On, they said, this is the last episode. Draw as many lines and paint in as many shadows as you possibly can. So from the looks of it, Cowdy and Mary mopped up the first floor pretty easily. They get up to the second floor and they're both kind of looking around like, hey, Clive, where you at, bitch? Where you at? And Mary decides to take this moment to turn Cowdy around toward her and then get her with a gut punch. Well, this is immediately after they have questioned a guy like, hey, where's Clive at? And, and he, he dude's like, him... he's on the second floor. So Cowrie is just as prepared to go on up there and wreak havoc. But yes, Mary punches Cowrie in the gut. Just kind of like, what? <laughs> <laughs> if you guys know the the Bill Hader joke that he tells on, I think it was... It, it was, was Conan, right? It was either Conan or Jimmy Kimmel. It was one or the other. I think you're right. It might have been Conan. Just, what? And Mary's just, like, going off by herself. I'm sorry. So, so Kauri has passed out. Mary's trying to go up here and do it all on her own because she's making really stupid decisions. Supposedly, she was a really fucking good sweeper, but she's making a lot of dumbass decisions. Well, because, again, she is very emotionally compromised. That's how much this David guy... Eric. Or not da Eric. Sorry, all the different white guy names I'm, I'm not used to in this show. No, like, she cares that much about Eric. She's just thinking with her heart, her gut. So, she's not making smart decisions right now. Right. Thankfully, though, even though she has just knocked the wind out of Cowdy, it is only just now that Ryo and Umibozu have caught up to them. So with Umibozu and Ryo there, they're looking around like, uh, of course, Kaori hit absolutely everything except the dudes. It's like Ryo is really kind of making a joke out of it. But Umibozu kind of sees it for what it is. No, like, Umi for Umibozu, game recognizes game. He's like, well, from my point of view, it looks like she's really talented to have known how to not hit these guys. And remember, Umibozu here is the one who trained Kaori in the usage of higher weapons and traps. So he's not a slouch when it comes to this stuff. He would recognize talent if he saw it. That is very true. And, and Kaori learned from him, so she learned from the best. Exactly. And Ryo... I don't know that he can be that objective when it comes to Cowdy's ability with firearms. Because he's always trying to think of her right. as, like, weaker or having to protect her all the time. So maybe he's not the best judge of her marksmanship ability. I think Ryo doesn't give her enough credit sometimes. I mean, for sure, yeah. And so it's only at that point that they've talked about her skill that Ryo finally decides to look a little to the right and see that Cowdy's knocked out against a pillar. They don't really stop to ask how that happened, but I guess they kind of figure it out. Ryo doesn't come in on like, all concerned, like, oh my god, Kauri, what are you doing passed out? He is just kind of like, hey, Kauri, maybe don't sleep there, because you might catch that cold you had. Which, again, I'm surprised that he bothered enough to remember she had a cold. He cares enough when he wants to. So, uh, Cowdy finally wakes up like, huh, what, what's going on? Ryo, you're here. Oh, shit, Mary, she ran off. And Ryo, again, just kind of looks like, huh. Like, he doesn't seem worried about this situation that much. He knows he needs to be there, but he feels like, well, uh, we've got this under control. We don't need to stress about this. We got this. So just ahead of them here on the second floor, Mary enters a lobby area where sure enough, David Clive is waiting for her, being all evil and laughing and shit, being like, ha ha, you think you got the drop on me, Mary? Surprise, I got a bunch of dudes with guns right here. I don't know why she didn't just go in for the shot immediately because then he wouldn't have been able to give orders to anybody
somebody to shoot her. And mind you, she talks about taking the shot, but she doesn't take the shot. Also, like, she just waited. She waited for the dudes to show up. She should have just shot him the second that she got into the room, before all the dudes came out from the shadows. Now, to be fair, if she had shot him, she might not have found out where Eric was. Like, maybe she has to question him first. Because she doesn't know exactly where he is in the building right now. But the building is only so big. I mean, admit, it, it could have gone either way. Like, if she needed more time, yeah, but it doesn't come across that way. Like, that's the rationale I would have gone with. Like, I need this guy alive so I can find out where my boyfriend is. Otherwise, yeah, if I don't need that information, I'm taking the shot. I would have taken the shot. And she talks about doing it. That's what I'm saying. Like, she should have just done it because she was talking about doing it. Either way, by the end of it, turns out that's not really super necessary because here he is about to call his dudes to take a shot anyway. And she's talking logic into him like, maybe I should just shoot you anyway because, like, what reason do all of these mercenaries have after this? Like, they're just gonna walk away because now they're not gonna get paid. They don't have to take orders from you anymore. So if I kill you, like, why? are they gonna care? They're not actually gonna kill me. Who's gonna pay them? And he's over here like, oh shit, you're right. Shoot her! Shoot her! While I'm still alive to give you that command. <laughs> but then a bunch of shots ring out and a bunch of bazookas go off. Well, at least one bazooka. A bunch of bazooka shots go off. Let's put it that way. A bunch way. of bazooka shots, but also like what? An Uzi? Yes. And then you're like, oh my god, who is it? Is, and it, is it Ryo and Umi Bozu? I figure it's Ryo and Umi Bozu. No, it's not actually Ryo and Umi Bozu. It's Ryo and Cowdy. Umi Bozu's not here right now. Where is Umi Bozu? Don't that worry, was, that's that not important that'll right now. That'll be important later. But you see Cowdy and Ryo, for the first time, as far as I'm concerned, looking at this show, this is them obviously operating in concert together as City Hunter. Like, they each took out their targets on the second floor. I don't think this is the first time it's happened. It's just very rare that it happens, and it does seem like a very decidedly coordinated effort. But, I mean, they didn't really plan this. This is just sort of how it ended up, because they both arrived at the building at slightly different times. But you think about it, though. This is in stark contrast to, say, last season's sure, finale. Sure, sure. And even a lot of stuff in this season, too, where Cowdy is usually the one that has to be rescued. Right. Like, you compare it to last season where she was, you know, captured there on the boat with the three siblings. Mm -hmm. She couldn't do shit. That's true. That's this season, true. she showed up first. She was wrecking she shit. She did a lot of work. She really made it a lot easier. Like, hey, I got the place warmed up for you. Exactly. That's what I'm saying. This shows growth for her as City Hunter's partner. I would agree. Yeah. From this point on, they are definitely a working team. I think you're going to see a lot of that, I think, even in early episodes episodes of City Hunter 3 and City Hunter 91, just how coordinated they are and very decidedly both call themselves City Hunter. Yes, like by this point she's earned the right to also being able to call herself City Hunter. Yes, I agree. So now that all his dudes have been taken out, Clyde has no choice but to play his trump card and pull Eric out from behind a pillar who's clearly been beaten up. Yeah, he's not looking super great right now. I almost wondered like, oh wow, has he been captured for so long that he's grown this full facial hair? Oh no, he's had that. No, yeah, he had that. <laughs> I mean, granted, he probably hasn't shaved in a couple of days, but as far as we're aware, it's only been so many days that both she and him got to Japan and then she contacted Ryo. That's true. That's true. Like, I think at best it's been somewhere between three to five days. I would agree. That sounds about correct. So now he's like, all right, Mary, listen, if you don't shoot Ryo right now, then I'm going to shoot Eric. Also, Ryo, if you don't shoot Mary, then Mary's going to shoot you. Like, in what universe does he think that works? Because, like, like neither of those, uh, uh, those instructions are just like, hey, wait a minute, nobody wins here if we do this. That's a stupid thing to tell us to do. Because, well, like, he's, he is banking on something that he's half right about in that she cares so much for Eric that she's willing to make some stupid decisions. But, one, how good of a sweeper was she that she can't take the shot? That's one thing. Right. And then, two, Rio's here. He's a really good shot. <laughs> Even if he wasn't going to shoot directly at you, he can ricochet that shit. Honestly, like, when I first saw 
saw this episode, I thought, oh, he's just gonna shoot past Mary and hit Clive. Right. Like, it really could have gone in that direction very, very easily. I'm glad that it doesn't because I feel like we very well utilize everybody in this scene. So, he, they're receiving these instructions, you two have to shoot each other, and Riel goes ahead and he pulls out his own gun. The Magnum. Which, again, reminder, Rio was shooting an Uzi a second ago, which is pretty crazy, but now he's, he's, he's got his own gun. I mean, he just took an Uzi off somebody else, is the we way I We just never it. see him shoot an Uzi. That's Well, yeah, that, that's the thing. Predominantly, he doesn't use other guns, except in Nikki Larson and Shinjuku Private Eyes. Uh-huh. In any case, so now he's pointing his 357 at Mary, and Mary's like, are you serious? Are we gonna do this? And Rio's like, yeah, he said we have to. Kaori, mind you, is behind her like, just do what he says, but also, he's probably gonna tell you to dodge, so when he does that, then just do it. And she's like, what? And this is the thing. Mary does not recognize a Rio that is able to work well with somebody that's not her. Mm -hmm. And that's on her for not realizing that he could do that. That he had room to come up with other plans. To build other... up communications with other human beings. And the thing, though, is this builds off of the events of 357 Magnum. That Cowdy finally, after like the third duel she's witnessed, realizing that Rio must have a plan. Right. So they're pointing guns at each other. Mary's like, all right, let me point my gun at him. Clive's over here looking at the both of them like the sickos meme, like, ha ha ha, yes, ha. They're gonna do it. They're just gonna, both gonna murder each other. Like, that would solve any... This is just the stupidest thing. I also, don't know. on top of that, this is the stupid thing for Clive, too. Clive has completely discounted that Cowdy's there. I'm just only realizing this right now as I say this. Cowdy could have shot him. She really could have. She could have saved everybody right here. But actually, no, somebody else is going to save everybody right now. Suddenly, the whole building is rumbling. Clive is over here like, hey, what the fuck? And Cowdy's like, all right, get down. Rio's like, get down. So they both go dodging, and then the building is all rumbling, and it's shaking, and then Rio runs over to Clive while the building is shaking, and he's freaking out, and he doesn't know what's going on, but Rio is just cool as a cucumber, and he just socks Clive in the face, knocks him out, and picks up the boyfriend, Eric, that just, he's been- Just as the, the floor is giving out. And Rio is like running away from a crumbling floor, all Indiana Jones style, while carrying, like, fireman carrying- this man over his shoulder and the whole second floor just gives out Clive goes falling through and you see him this like animation is crazy too oh yeah like, like there's so much detail in his face in the shadowing and you just see every detail of his just horrified face while his entire body is just limply flailing through this rubble as it's falling to the floor below it and he's just there crumpled up under all this rubble so he's been taken out probably all... dead no he's he's actually okay somehow I don't know how. But this is all thanks to our friendly neighborhood, Umibozu. And Kaori makes sure to mention, yeah, Umibozu is like a fantastic demolitionist. Of course he was going to have this thing on lock. And Umibozu's just complaining here in the corner like, I wish I got to do the cool shit. I got to do all the floor demolitions I think off that's, screen. I think that stuff is the cool shit. I mean, it is. It is the cool shit. He doesn't need to complain about it. It's cool. And I guess that's the end of that chapter because we immediately go to the next day back at the apartment where we see Eric is laid up in bed. I assume it's Rio's room because there's a bunch of liquor bottles strewn about the room. Yeah, that makes sense. I would assume that that is his room, yeah. I and mean, it, his room looks different all the time. They never draw it consistently. Yeah. And Mary's there doting over him as he's passed out. You know, gives him a little kiss as he's passed out like, I must leave you. I cannot do this. <laughs> And so she, like, real dramatically, like a, a soap opera, leaves out the front door while the wind is blowing through her hair. While she leaves her boyfriend passed out and all, like, with broken well, limbs. Well, not and boyfriend, stuff. fiance. But she hasn't said it yet. Nobody's actually said that yet. I'm just we saying. Don't, we don't know that at this point in time. Well, I'm putting it out there to make her look worse. And so she goes to the airport. She somehow gets herself all the way over to the new international airport, which again, that's just Narita. And while she's over there, Sayako, of all people, you remember her? Oh yeah, she has to do police stuff sometimes. Well, Sayako has shown up to the whole demolished building. Yeah, the hotel. And Ryo's filling her in on everything, and Psycho's telling him, Well, you really did this a solid. Clive was wanted internationally. There was a worldwide manhunt looking out for him. So, good job. 
I think it's pretty crazy that Ryo gets to just stand there in the middle of, like, police shit, and he's not a cop, and they're not gonna get him on, like, I don't know, vigilante shit, or owning a gun, or any sort of weaponry like any of this. Somehow Sayako manages to sweep all this under the rug all the time. Wow, who were they firing at when the building collapsed? Dunno, guess they got away, guess they just started shooting at each other. Like, I, I don't mean, know. like this, by this point, this is like the fifth or sixth time this has happened on a major scale. So Surely she's used the, to it. I'm just saying, I feel like the police department would be like, hey, there's that guy again. Why is he always at places like this? I mean, this it's kind of a Gotham City setup that when Batman shows up, you kind of let him go through the police tape. I guess. And not necessarily because you're like, oh, I respect that guy. It's like, no, there's got to be somebody like Gordon being like, no, no, I'm I'm here to vouch for him. Let him pass. Like, like a Gordon that Batman is always trying to have sex with. D- don't ever forget. <laughs> Phrase it like that ever again. <laughs> Although I'm sure somebody has written that fan fiction. Oh, I'm, I'm sure several somebodies have written that fan fiction. Anyway, Rio's done here at the scene of the crime. And yes, now we go back to the airport. Mary's ready to board Sunrise Air yet again. And she's like, no. I cannot return to Japan. I can't even go back to New York. I can't go back to America. I need to go somewhere else. I need to go to place. Like, there is, we don't know what plane to what destination she is getting on. Just that Sunrise Air flies there. Yes. That's all. Or at least flies to a connecting flight somewhere I'm, else. I'm going to say it's kind of cheap and it's a connecting flight. <laughs> I, I find it hard to believe Sunrise Air goes everywhere. Do, do you think Sunrise Air is domestic only? Well, you know what? It can't be domestic only because of all the flights to fake lands. But do you think all the fake lands had a connecting flight that got them on to Sunrise before See, they got I don't to know. Tokyo? I, I don't know. Like, maybe maybe it is Like, they flew into Hokkaido first, and then they had to get on Sunrise Air to go to Tokyo. I mean, it's, it's possible. Do you want a headcanon that they're domestic only? I don't know. <laughs> maybe. That could, that could be the case. Anyway, she's waxing poetic, looking out the window, looking all sad, and her aviator's like, I love Eric so much, but I cannot do this. <laughs> I cannot return to him. I love him, but I cannot do this. I am so sad that I had to leave Cowdy and Rio because they were so nice to me. I should apologize to them, but I cannot do this. That would be the, the right thing to do, is realizing I was a piece of shit. I should apologize, but I'm not gonna do it. Like, this is, she's just... I th- I hate her. I hate her so much. She's a she's a really terrible person. Thankfully, right now somebody pulls a gun on her. Oh, that's good. Yeah, somebody. This tells you what the airport was like at the time. Anybody can just walk into the airport and walk all the way up to the terminal. Up to you, the gate. Up to the gate. You don't even have to have a ticket to get on a plane. You just go walk up to the gate to tell people goodbye and also bring a gun with you <laughs> while you're up there. You just bring this gun. So now there's a gun being pointed at her back. At By some moment. taller man telling her that she cannot escape. And she just like, you, you like, must go to the other world that you are familiar with. And she's just there like, <gasps> an assassin? You're trying to get me to harm somebody again. Well, I won't do it. And the guy with the gun's like, no, you need to go back to Eric. Why? Who are you? <laughs> <laughs> so she finally turns around and it's just Rio and another pair of aviators. And a hat. And a little hat. And the gun is a toy gun that shoots out clown flowers. Uh, a bouquet of flowers. And then he throws away the glasses and the hat and the gun with the flowers. Like, at least give this nice lady some flowers? I Why know, did you man. throw the flowers away? She's about to get on a plane and leave forever. What is wrong with you? I just like that between the two of us, when he pulled the gun on her, he used that line. We're like, Ugo Kuna! <laughs> Ugo Kuna! Ugo Kuna! Which, again, like, we're very specifically referencing a New Japan wrestling Shtick, a gimmick of one wrestler pulling a gun out in the ring, and then a bajillion other wrestlers come out, and they don't do anything to stop him because he keeps pointing at them with the gun and yelling, Ugo Kuna! And he even, points, Kuna! He even points it at the audience, and they're all raising their Ugo hands. Kuna! Ugo Kuna! Don't move, don't move, don't... Freeze! Freeze! Yeah. Freeze! And so Ryo throws everything away, tells Mary, all right, come on back, let's go. And Mary's there chastising Ryo, don't you know what this is? Don't you know who I actually am as a person? I'm not like you, Ryo. I'm not strong. I can't protect the person that I'm in love with. 
And then suddenly, Kaori and Eric are both there, and Eric's got his arm in a sling, so his arm is, like, bruised or broken or battered or something. I assume that, like, they broke his arm trying to, like, hold him in captivity and be like, haha, we gotta mess you up before Mary gets here. Shall we mean business? So Eric is like, Mary, you're so cruel to leave your fiancé injured and just abandon him. Whoa, 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 whoa. So this is the first time we're hearing the word fiancé. This is the very first time here at the end of the episode. (laughs) Oh, you guys have been in engaged this whole time oh well no wonder maybe you should have said that a little sooner yeah like you never said he asked you to marry him or or maybe he's the other way or that you both kind of had a conversation and came to like a mutual like yeah we should get married that would be great like good for you that's a very modern kind of approach like i i do like that cowdy and rio were already on top of what kind of shit mary was gonna pull like i can't go back to him i can't face eric and cowdy just shows up with him i got him right here yeah. Kauri even kind of further pushes, like, she's starting to blush as she says this next thing, like, listen, Mary, just from personal experience, uh, if you're with the person that you love, then you can do anything. You can overcome any obstacle, climb any mountain, climb the highest mountains even, sing the kind of songs you want to sing. <laughs> And she's saying this right in front of Rio too. So, like, I feel like she's pretty conscious of what she means when she says that. And thankfully, this is enough for Eric to piggyback off and be like, look, baby, I'm with you for the long haul. I don't care who you are, where you're from, or what you did, as long as you love me. That was a Backstreet Boys reference. Backstreet Uh, (laughs) Boys hadn't made that song yet. Give him a decade. He's like, even if you were to run away right now, I would just chase you around the world. I would just follow you everywhere you go, which is kind of fucking weird. But, uh, but I, I understand the depths of what he feels. It's I not get that it. weird if they've had conversations about getting married. That's what you'd expect out of your fiance, I imagine. Uh, a little, maybe. Oh, come on. Well, if a person tells you, no, don't come, then... Um, well, because you know Mary's just being overdramatic right now. Oh, she is. She is. She, she's kind of a tool. <laughs> and I mean, he- I, I'm, I'm glad that she found somebody who doesn't think she's a tool. Great. Maybe he can keep her from being a tool in the future i don't know like she's he's there telling her come on baby don't do me like that and then she finally breaks down like oh eric all right fine i won't do you like that and then i guess he also bought a ticket to get on the same flight to wherever it is she's going because they both get on the plane anyway i just i would have not run to grab and embrace him pushing in oh, yeah, on no. the bad arm yeah she she grabs like she leans in on on the broken arm He doesn't say anything, but in my head, I'm feeling like, oh! (laughs) And, like, when they get on the plane, Eric's got the aisle seat. Yeah, so, like, she's holding his hand as they take off, but I'm sitting here in the back of my head thinking, oh, man, she gave him the drink cart aisle. (laughs) And that that arm that's out in the aisle is the broken arm. It's gonna get slammed by these drink carts passing by, I promise you. Like, oh, my God, baby, we're gonna start a whole new life together. (laughs) Oh! (laughs) Would you like some snacks? (laughs) Oh! <laughs> like, that's the most, like, National Lampoon... Ginger ale? Psh- oh! <laughs> naked gun stuff that you can imagine. Yeah. And so they take off on the plane, and, you know, Mary's looking out the window being like, Wow, you really changed as a person, Rio. I, I-, I hope one day I can change the same way you did. And Cowdy, hopefully I can be as strong as you are one day. And then Cowry, as if she can do mind reading from about a mile away, is well, like... from the roof of the parking garage. Is like, yeah, Mary, and I hope that we can continue to be good partners over here, too. And then they, they have this really sweet, like, montage? Well, it starts right here with Rio also kind of feeling the mood right now. Yeah. Because, again, Cowdy said all of that in front of Rio and Blush and there is less pretense about how they feel about each other in these three episodes than most other episodes we've seen. That is very true. So Ryo, just like he does here in the Sarah opening, just puts his arm around her and is just looking at her in a way I can't describe other than lovingly. Yeah, uh, there's this really nice song that plays, and I think the song has played throughout the show You know that, before. without you in my life. Yeah, they just let it play out for a really long time, for like a couple of minutes. It's a really slow, we, we need to hold on 
on these character moments of the two of them being together, and they're not even doing anything in particular. Yes, they walk away from the airport. They're driving back to they, Shinjuku. They get, they get back in the Mini Cooper, and they drive away from the airport, and we just see them kind of sitting in silence with each other, but they look, like, just happy to be sitting in the car together. There's these really detailed shots of them driving down the highway. Like, they've really taken a lot of highway detail, I, I thought was kind of impressive. They're just walking through the park together doing nothing. Like, that's a very date kind of yeah. a thing to do. Just, they're not trying to get anywhere. They're not trying to do anything. They're just being together in the park with the flower petals. And then they get to where a bunch of kids are playing and they're just watching a bunch of kids playing in front of, like, the diet building, I guess. I don't like, know how you look at the two of them and not think they're a couple right. right now while this montage is happening. Yeah. And so then it cuts away to the next morning and Cowdy's made a big-ass breakfast again. Just the most scrambled eggs you've ever seen in your life. <laughs> and I guess Real really must like scrambled eggs. I mean, scrambled eggs are delicious. They are. And he's remarking, wow, Cowdy, you didn't need to make all this much breakfast. And she's kind of like, she's in an apron, but she's almost kind of significant otherly, wifely, like doting on him. Like, well, I need my man strong, kind of almost. Well, that certainly feels like the atmosphere. And then he kind of responds back to her like, hey, I just wanted to say I'm sorry for everything I did to make you worry about me. And in that context, there's not a lot he can be referring to in the context of these last three episodes. Because mm -hmm. to recap, Ryo has not actually done that much to either offend Cowdy or do anything to give her a negative opinion. Right. The whole time it's been Mary. And right. they know that. The only thing that he could possibly be talking about right now is giving Cowdy the impression that Mary meant more to him than she does. Well, and also that Rio didn't care enough about Cowdy to be able to tell her about things. Right, that too. And so there's not a lot you can say that doesn't say this is about something deeper. But on top of that, uh, there are moments where you can feel that when he is acting sincere, it's also about to turn into a joke. And this is kind of one of those moments where I think he means it, but also he's clearly trying to butter her up for something. The thing is, they're having this moment right now. They are having this moment, like and Kauri is definitely in the moment, and she closes her eyes and hopes that he's going to kiss her right now. Well, yeah, because they, they do that anime thing where they say each other's name, Kauri, Ryo, and then, yeah, she closes her eyes and she, she perks up her face. She's like puckering a little bit, like, come at me, bro. And then he, he's like, Kauri, can you do something for me? Can you please make me younger? And I mean in my 20s, not a 30-year-old man. It is really embarrassing to be the leading man here in this piece of fiction that he's not really... He doesn't really know he's in this piece of fiction. In this piece of fiction, I, I can't be a 30-year-old man. Like, I think it's really funny that that's what he's buttering her up for, to try to get her to change his age, which actually means that he feels like she's the one who holds the reins on how old he is. He he could just make that decision for himself. He could. He really could, but he's decided Kauri is important enough that she's the one that makes that decision. Well, because she's the one who did make that decision. Because again, as we covered last week, nobody else, no other partner he's ever had has gone so far to do that for him, to designate, hey, this is your birthday. This is when we celebrate your life every year. And she being the one who's done that, he knows that she has the power there. She's the one who gave that gift to him to look at it in a certain light so he knows he has to go through her first he can't just declare that because that would be kind of rude so even if he's like trying to bicker with her about it once again he could just decide no i'm not 30 i'm 26 he could just say, he that, could if just he, say that if he wanted to but he doesn't and i no. think that's important and she bickers back like no you can't do that i made the decision and it stays but I do know something that might make you feel a little better. We've got another case lined up, and it's with a rich daughter of a wealthy family. And so she's feeling pretty okay. Like, she's feeling like going easy on him right now, even, because normally, even Ryo comments on it as they go out to pick up this job. Like, you wouldn't normally be okay with us picking up a job from another lady. And she's like, well, I mean, if it's for work, you know, like... I'm deciding to trust you. You know, we're trying to grow as partners. The only way I can grow is to trust you. So I'm, I'm going to do that. I'm going to trust you, and you're already 
betraying my trust. Well, he, he immediately says, oh, okay, great, then I have permission to be all mokuri horny on the job then. And she, like, she heard him say that. Like, I, I like, think maybe seems... maybe she was lying to herself, like, well, he's not going to immediately do it, right? But then he immediately does it. Like, they see the client, and she is very pretty, and he, he goes in all hard chasing this woman around. And so Kaori is very mad, and she's got to bring out a hammer. And the hammer is great because it says very specifically 114 tons. This is, in grand total, from season one to season two, this is episode 114. Exactly. So, again, like another episode, I think it was 107 or 109. This is another episode It was 109. 109, where the, where the hammer weight is the episode order number. I think that's clever. And especially because this is the season finale. Yeah. So, it, this is kind of how it ends with Ryo getting hit with this hammer and the zoom out and the still love her playing. But and he's it, like, but you said... But I feel like the way this has ended, it, it really does feel like there was no assurance that there was going to be more City Hunter made after this. Uh-huh. Like, if it were to have ended right here, you could have felt like, wow, that was just a nice ending and also... City Hunter still continues doing City Hunter things, and then they kept picking up work, and Ryo was still horny, and Kaori still hit him with a hammer. And but they, they kept still love it. each other. But they still, they clearly love each other. Like, you could have stopped here and said, that was a really decent, okay, nice place to just stop. I mean, thankfully, it didn't disappear forever. No, We've got didn't. so much more City Hunter content after this. Right, and so that right there is the end of City Hunter 2. Yay! Yay! All right. Hey, how long have we been doing this whole show? What? what? Better part of two plus years now, I think. God, should I look that up? Uh, Yeah, if you go up to your YouTube. Um, no, not the YouTube. Well, no, because your YouTube will say... The podcast upload website that I throw it onto would be better if I... Well, I mean, if you go to the YouTube, you you write on their original air date. I, I do write on their, the original air date. Hold on. Shut up. Go all the way down. Episode zero. Shut up. Shut up. 2021. Like two and a half years? Have yeah, we, two and a half years. We've we been doing this for two and a half years and we only just got to the end of season two? I season mean, two, Josh. We, we have taken a couple of weeks off in between. Yeah, but even then, that wouldn't have pushed us that much farther ahead. Not really. Maybe about a, mm, uh, give or take a month. A month to two months difference, yeah. honestly. That's, that's, God, really? Really? Yeah. Oh my God. So anyway, what is supposed to be coming immediately after this in chronological order was Bay City Wars? When was that released? Oh God, I don't know. 1990? Uh, so, City Hunter 2 ended, uh, 1989, City Hunter 3, uh... uh. No, we need to continue with this. Oh, oh. Yeah, no, that wasn't right. We, we weren't gonna do Bay City Wars next. It's City Hunter 3. Oh, okay, cool. Oops. <laughs> well, at least well, we, we caught that. We, we weren't gonna. We weren't gonna do it next week anyway. We were gonna do Netflix City Hunter. Oh, okay. Next. So that still works out. Like yeah, we, we've fine. got it ready. We've got it in. We've got it loaded in the chamber. So to go ahead and talk about everything that we just finished here, like we're kind of saying at the beginning of the episode, really, if you're only gonna watch so much City Hunter, if you were going to get off the train, this isn't a bad place to get off the train. Right, but also don't get off the train. But also don't get off the train. Because there's lots of good City Hunter still coming, although, um, man, I really do not like the opening sequence of City Hunter 3. <laughs> yeah, which we'll talk about in, like, two episodes of the podcast. Oh, man. Once we get there. I don't, don't want to get ahead of myself, but I do love this season so much because I love the music. I do love the I music. I love the build-up. I love how much you can see the growth in all these characters, how much Ryo trusts Umibozu, how much Kaudi has grown as a partner. I'm, I am going to miss this season quite a bit. There are moments in some of the next two seasons, but they're real few and far between. They're uh-huh. real brief, and that's largely due to the fact that these are short seasons. What City Hunter 3 is only 13 episodes. City Hunter 
91 is only 13 episodes. These so really, are they're really only, short. They're one core each. Yeah. Where seasons one and season two were well beyond that. Well, season one was a full year. Season two was beyond a full year. Which again speaks to the popularity at the time. Right. At the time, it was it was going pretty hard. And so I'm a little surprised, you know, the anime stops in 1991 and then you don't hear anything about it for a very, very, very long time. And then suddenly 2019 happened and it's like, hey, remember City Hunter? Maybe we should do something with that. And then enough people are out there like, hell yeah, City Hunter. Yeah, let's do it. And now we're up to Netflix. So next week, guys, Netflix. Yeah. All right. I, the other thing, just to kind of briefly go back over, there's only so many characters that I feel like really elicit an emotional response from us. You really didn't like Mary. She's a selfish, negative, mean, cruel person. And then when she has any sort of self-reflection at all, she doesn't actually do anything with it. Like, those are narcissistic traits if I've ever seen them. You wonder if that's not the reason they stopped being partners. Uh, it could be. We don't know why that happened. Unless it's just because Ryo was like, I'm going to Japan. And Mary was like, well, I'm not gonna do that. Like, it could just be as simple as that. I don't know. Like, I wonder if it wasn't the same time that happened. Like, if I headcanon that mess, that it's the same day that they were both out at the pool. And Ryo's like, hey, I'm kind of done with your ass. Deuces. He walked off. And just as he walked off, Eric came up like, hey, baby, you kind of hot. Want a model? <laughs> <laughs> if only. Yeah, like maybe she was real sad and heartbroken and lonely and Eric was just like the first guy <laughs> to, to do anything. Like he was watching from across the pool and he's like, oh, now's my chance. <laughs> Guess what, baby? I'm gonna make you a star. And it was that easy. Like she was only sad for so long. Well, yeah, she really thought, man, I really thought that being around Rio and in this lifestyle was all I ever had going for me. But some dude immediately said, saw that I could be more than that and I was like great I'll take it some stranger I had never met convinced me I was hot and to take pictures <laughs> like when I phrase it that way it sounds awful it was just that easy and so now we look forward to the end of the week when City Hunter comes out I'm sure we'll say something over on Twitter like our initial base responses about sure, it sure sure but uh, no my hopes are high for it uh, I do temper them just a little bit because it's it's Netflix so they tend to goof on some things, but right now, I feel pretty good about it. Most of the beats that you expect out of what City Hunter is supposed to be seem to be there in the trailer. I know, like, I'm, I'm starting to realize it's insane to think, no, Nikki Larson is setting the bar. We need to do better than Nikki Larson. And really, it should just be as simple as actually use Japanese people in Japan in Shinjuku, and then you immediately win. But I don't know, Nikki Larson was just that good. I don't know. Nikki Larson was just that good. I know, it's insane. <laughs> but for right now, the jury is out, and we will give our verdict next episode. Next episode. I'm excited. So come back next time when we cover the brand new Netflix City Hunter movie. And if you want to catch us outside this podcast, you can always find us both over on most social media. I'm at Josh Knight First. And I'm at Mars Girl. Thank you all so much for listening to our 115th episode of Moko Replay. And if you don't come back next episode, Josh is going to get tired of anime. Kaylin, I'm nearing the end of my 30s, and you think I'm going to get tired of anime now? We're watching a live-action movie next week. Well, I mean, a live-action, that's different. <laughs>